Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette number 166, where we read and review philosophy live on the internet. So, we're doing the, uh, because America, we're doing some philosophy of race this week. So, let's see what we get. And mostly just random papers, but this week we're doing random papers that are in a category. So, philosophy of gender, philosophy of race, yay! Okay. to help here, so contemporary stuff. Uh, well, this is just, uh, found this is the best way to get stuff from, uh, uh, in this uh, category, you just go to the uh, publication and they go like a few pages in because you get all the stuff that uh, hasn't really been loaded up at the very top, but then here we get this other stuff. Okay, so let's see, what do we have? Stain removal, ethics, and race. Uh, this is gonna be, uh, let's see, can public virtues be global? Is this race or is this something else? This is, yes, international ethics. I guess it falls under this, I guess. We need more transitional justice. All right, take a look at that one. It's philosophy of race. Glued to the image, critical phenomenology of racialization through works of art. Sounds interesting. Ooh, art and art criticism. That I don't always get to that e journal, but that's always fun. Let's see what else we got. Discriminatory attitude toward, toward vulnerable groups in Singapore, prevalence predictors and pattern. Journal behavioral science. I don't usually do journal behavioral science because it's too uh, sciencey and sitting around reading a. Uh, Reading uh, scientific data is very hard to uh, do. I did this categorical injustice. That was a very nice piece by Asta. Uh, let's see, Down Girl. That's a review by, of that book by Kate Mann. So, I saw Kate Mann say she's going to come out with a, uh, another book. I don't know when, but so I think Down Girl got a lot of uh, popularity. So maybe her next book will be interesting too. What happens when we talk also about race? It was a review by George Nancy. Race, magic, and the yellow peril. This is another um, art, aesthetics, and art criticism. How to achieve reference to covert social constructions. Take a look at that. Tales from an apostate. From philosophical issues. Okay. Plenty of stuff to see if uh, is available. to this one so we got this one let's take a look real quick see don't have access to this all right so it's 16 pages, oh, single space. I do not like reading things uh, this long. Oh, this is a behavioral science one too. Yeah, this is gonna be a, let's just take a look at what it looks like. Yeah, tons of uh, data studies. Uh, spammers, yeah, see, data. All right, I'm not reading data, sorry. Meeting campus climate implicit bias training is not enough. Philosophy of education. Let's take a look. Is this here? Is it available? Nope. Okay. Race magic and the yellow pearl. I wonder what that. Not, what was the yellow pearl? I don't even know. Um. Let's see. Race magic and the yellow pearl. Eleven pages. That's do oh, but double columned. Oh, but we got pictures. I like pictures. All right. So this is a possibility. Okay, um, yeah, Orient. All right, so that's what it is. It's the old uh, reference to Chinese people, I guess. Uh, let's see, how to achieve reference to covert social constructions. All right, so this is here. Let's see what this one is. Tales from an apostate. I don't know what that means, but we'll find out maybe.
Mm, yeah, no access, which is too bad. So let's see what we got between these two hikes. You've referenced to covert social constructions. All right, and we've got race magic and the yellow peril. All right, so we're gonna do aesthetics of race, I guess. I don't know if you can see this little uh, thing here, but we've got the aesthetics of race versus um, social constructionism again. You know, let's do the aesthetics. I like some aesthetics and uh, there's pictures. I like pictures. So, why not? Alright. So, if you are in the chat, you can grab the uh, link right there. And you can always um, get the, uh, if you show up late and the link isn't there anymore, yeah, you can get it by typing exclamation point paper and putting it into the chat and the link will pop back up. And it'll be below the uh, video on later on the YouTube. So. Okie dokie. Race Magic and the Yellow Parable by Mylin Chin. And I apologize for how I say all these. Uh, I'm sure I will not be saying the Chinese correctly here because it looks like it's about Chinese stuff. So, let's get going. The master said, the people of the south have a saying, someone without constancy cannot be a magician. Seems right. Okay, the case of the rival Chinese magicians. On the eve of March 23rd, 1918, the Wood Green Empire, the in, the Wood Green Empire Theater in London overflowed with an audience eager to see the most popular Chinese magician at the time in a show billed as Chung Ling Su, the world's greatest magician, in a performance of oriental splendor and weird mysticism, assisted by Miss Sui Xin presenting in rapid succe succession the most beautiful, baffling, and interesting series of illusions even submitted to, ever, even submitted to the public. Maybe that was ever, but I don't know. On this soon-to-be historic occasion, Chung Ling Su performed his signature bullet catching trick for the last time. And the trick, called Condemned to Death by the Boxers, Defying Their Bullets, Su used a porcelain plate to catch marked bullets shot at him by assistants who were dressed as boxer firing squad in a nod to the 1900 anti-imperialist boxer rebellion in China. This evening, however, one of the rifles malfunctioned and a real bullet rather than a blank fired, striking Su in the chest and piercing his lung. Having only ever spoken Chinese on stage, Su shocked his audience by crying out in native English, Oh my god, something's happened, lower the curtain. He collapsed on stage and was dead by morning. In the legal investigation and media circus following his death, the secret to his bullet catch trick was inevitably revealed, but more astonishing, unma astonishing unmasking was Sue's true identity as William Ellsworth Robinson, a New Yorker of Scottish ancestry. Wait, so is that like, uh, what was it, Kung Fu, that guy who was also uh, like Irish or Scottish and was playing uh, the Chinese uh, martial artist? Hmm. Complex sociocultural, political, and aesthetic factors contributed to the success of Robinson's act, but the first and simplest truth of the matter is that he stole the persona of a real Chinese magician named Qing Ling Fu, the original Chinese conjurer, to become Qing, Chung Ling Su, the marvelous Chinese conjurer. Qing Ling Fu was a stage young of uh, Zhu Lian Kui, born in Beijing in 1854, a practitioner of traditional Chinese magic, skilled enough to have performed as the court conjurer to the Empress Dowager Si Shi. He also performed in European-owned theaters in China before finding fame in America, including sold-out shows at Keats Union Square Theater in New York. On June 3rd, 1899, an article entitled A Wonderful Conjurer, the New York Dramatic Mirror said of him, he is no ordinary professor of a luxury domain, he is Qing Ling Fu, but a past master in the art of fooling people before their very eyes, who has come all the way from the Far East to show us a few tricks we have ne never seen before. Alright, so I guess this is this is the Irishman's, uh, the Scottishman's version, Chung Ling Su, not... Um, Ching Ling, but Chung Ling. So. Okay. He went on to tour internationally with his troupe of acrobats and jugglers, as well as his daughter, Chi Toi, who was billed at one point as the only small footed girl sing singing coon songs. In this bizarre hit, that is bizarre. In this bizarre atmosphere of ethnic entertainment, Robinson was not the first magician to imitate Ching Ling Fu, nor was he a stranger to copying other magicians' racialized acts. 
1877, Robinson had performed as Ahmed Ben Ali in an act lifted from the German magician Max Ozinger, also known as Ben Ali Bey. Robinson did not find success. Hey, how you doing, Azadl? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I hope, well, I hope your errands go well. Robinson did not find success copying a German imitating an Arab magician, but in 1900s his fortune shifted when, in response to the call for Chinese magician to perform at the Follies Bergere in Paris, he adopted the persona and much of the magic act of Qing Ling Fu. He went on to perform one of the highest paid and most popular magicians, to become one of the highest paid and most popular magicians in the era despite Fu's repeated attempt to expose him as a phony, including challenging him to publicly prove his Chineseness and originality as a magician. How did Robinson pull off his most infamous illusion? Robinson's success masquer successful masquerade as a Chinese magician for 18 years surely owed something to his skills as a magician. He was known as a technically adept magician, but a poor showman prior to adopting his Chinese persona. But more than that, his performance was possible, desirable, and believable because of a confluence of factors beyond his individual abilities. For one, there was a public audience willing to ignore evidence of his true identity and their desire for Chineseness more exotic and exaggerated than any Chinese magician could deliver. Yeah, he's a stereotype. This was the era of vaudeville circus and wildly pop popular ethnic performances through which audiences lived out their stereotyped, racialized, and racist fantasies in especially cartoonish fashion. The more unbelievable, the better. This period also sh shaped by what Chris Godo Jones has helpfully theorized as the cultural and political nexus of secular stage magic, modernity, and orientalism. As he details it, this golden age of magic was marked by a shift away from real magic, occult, spiritual, irrational, and feminine, toward modern magic, magic that embraced assumptions about scientific and technological progress, was predominantly practiced by men, and was mirrored in the broader struggle between disenchantment and re-enchantment of the modern world. Adopting Eastern personas, Arabian genie, Indian yogi, Chinese mystic, or Japanese sorcerer allowed stage magicians to appropriate the aesthetic of real magic without violating the modern skepticism toward it and in effect displacing the problem of magic in the modern world to the pre-modern peripheries or drawing an origination in such peripheries as a means to claim authentic magic potency. Okay, so people were, since everyone was getting sort of scientific at the beginning of uh, the 20th century, they had to like draw upon these... Uh, other cultures to sort of get people into the mood for magic they wouldn't believe it if it was just some white guy doing the stuff but they had to add something to the act or else it wouldn't be sort of uh taken the right way okay so sociological factors in addition to these cultural and political forces driving the association of the Orient with magic, the craft of magic itself was pivotal in the aesthetic production of Chineseness Robinson offered his audiences. Specifically, the simultaneous real and unreal art of stage magic offered a paradoxically believable context for his yellow face persona. As Jason Leddington argues in The Experience of Magic, theatrical magic has an ironic antinomic structure in which impossible events are presented as impossible. When a magic trick is successful, it appears to be what it is simultaneously admits cannot be. That is, the audience must believe the trick is impossible and is happening anyway. Magic fails in the absence of this paradox. Following this line of analysis, the sense for and subversion of the limits of the possible in the theatrical magic helped set the cognitive stage for the kind of race performance Robinson pulled off. While he did not explicitly present his Chineseness as impossible in his show, he did not and could not fully conceal his true identity in ways that will be discussed later. The broader philosophical point here is that Robinson presented as Chinese in the context of an art, stage magic, in which odd things happen to normal belief structures. More unbelievable is not only better, but paradoxically believable. Another important and complex, I, mean, I guess maybe the use of paradox is contradictory believable, maybe. I don't know. Depends on exactly what's going on. Another important and complex factor in the racial aesthetics of Robinson's performance is that he never presented himself as fully Chinese. Rather, he claimed to be the mixed-race son of a Scottish missionary father and Cantonese mother. According to Robinson, he was orphaned at age 13, after which he was taken in by a Chinese magician named R.E. This father figure magician trained him in a mix of ancient Chinese and modern European magic, which Robinson began to perform upon his death. With this backstory, Robinson played upon the possibility of mixed-race uh, sar 
Sark Aesthetics to adopt Paul Taylor's terminology here. Sark Aesthetics are the practices of representational somatic aesthetics, which is to say those practices relating to the body as it were, as flesh regarded solely from the outside. These practices include norms and principles for aesthetic evaluation of the body, which are different and vaguer for mixed race bodies. Robinson leveraged stereotypical Chinese cultural aesthetics public ignorance about willful denial of real Chinese people and the possibility of mixed race visual ambiguity to conjure an image born of white culture and biological appropriation of Chineseness. While he dressed in traditional Chinese fashion, wore his hair in the symbolic queue, adopted a stereotypical adopted stereotypical mannerisms, and spoke to journalists solely through an interpreter in fake Chinese gibberish, it was a racialized mysteriousness of being Eurasian that lent his performative identity more persuasive aesthetic force than other white magicians pretending to be Chinese. Consider the familiarity question, what are you to a mixed race people, not to mention the ontological puzzle. Yeah, so his backstory helped his uh, presentation because it, pri I guess it primed the audience in certain ways, which uh, they argued was politically and uh, socially sort of what was needed to have the right theatricality. Okay. It was also critical that Robinson's masquerade as a Chinese magician took place during an era in which anti-Chinese racism and violence were at an all-time high in the United States, and the prejudices that came to ca characterize the yellow peril, the belief that East Asian peoples pose a unique threat to the West, were formed and fomented. Racism against Chinese was deeply entwined with economic anxieties about cheap Chinese labor, and structured in part by the widely held belief that the Chinese were unassimil unassimilable. Rather than assimilate, Chinese hordes would devour Christian America with the backward culture of Confucius and, as Senator John Miller of California put it, the gangrene of Oriental civilization. Oh. Times don't change, do they? <laughs> Eleven different bills calling for Chinese exclusion were submitted to Congress with speeches illustrating the Chinese threat and visceral imagery. Senator Aaron Sargent. Should we be a mere slop pail into which the dregs of humanity should be poured? The Chinaman can live on a dead rat and a few handfuls of rice and work for 10 cents a day. Senator John Miller. The Chinese are machine-like. They are automatic engines of flesh and blood. They herd together like beasts. We ask you to secure the Anglo-Saxon civilization, the American Anglo-Saxon civilization, without contamination or adulteration. Senator Salisbury. The Chinese do not and will not assimilate with our people. They come only to get money and return. They secretly maintain laws and government of their own. They bring with them their filth and frightful diseases. Yeah. In 1882, such rhetoric became officially draconian when President Chester A. Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law, barring Chinese laborers from entering the United States and marking the first and only time an entire racial and ethnic group has been banned from the country. Well, we've been trying lately. Let's see, what's number five? Okay, it's at the end. I was going to say... We've, we've gotten real close recently. I think it got stopped up or it got, uh, the recent laws got at least changed not to be just a racial or ethnic group. They sort of did some, uh, I think just semantic shift so it wouldn't look that, it wouldn't be that anymore. Anywho, I'm not an expert on U.S. law. Alright, continuing. But it, is a, but it is typical of racial prejudices that there were contradictory attitudes at play. Chinese people were reviled and even outlawed, yet their entertainment and aesthetics held unique esteem for audiences. Yeah, once you start banning people, it becomes taboo. It taboo becomes exciting at that point, once you have taboo things. So, it's kind of the nature of taboo. Once it becomes a taboo, then it becomes a fetish, and then uh, everyone wants a, a little bit of that forbidden knowledge or whatever. In fact, Ching Ling Fu leveraged this contradiction in his identity as an entertainer in order to serve, convent the anti-labor bias of the Exclusion Act and enter the United States. He was originally given access through an exception to the Exclusion Act for Chinese involved in construction and operating, constructing and operating exi exhibits of the Trans-Mississippi Exhibition in Omaha. Despite his acclaimed performances, which resulted in a vaudeville contract with Colonel John Hopkins, he and his troop were ordered back to China under the Exclusion Act once the Omaha Expo ended. He appealed, and in April 1899, a U.S. district judge ruled that the act did not apply to Qing because he was an entertainer rather than laborer. Still as popular as Qing Ling Fu, 
the real Chinese military team became Chung Ling Su, the imposter satisfied the racialized aesthetic desires of white audiences in ways Fu could not. A Chinese magician whose Chineseness was impossible was perfectly matched to American audiences at the time, which is to say Robinson's yellow face act was as believable as it was desired in the cultural nexus of Yellow Peril, the Exclusion Act, and the racialized ethnic vaudeville performances of the day. Yeah, because the, the white guy was giving the uh, audiences what they were expecting, not what the uh, actual Chinese person was going to do. Okay. Amid the reasons for Robinson's success, as Chung Ling Su sketched so far, the question of how race and magic dynamically intersected stands out. As noted, the ironic and paradoxical cognitive requirements of stage magic helped establish the conditions for a white magician to pass as Chinese in a bizarre kind of racial Turing test. What is stranger in thinking further about the relationship between magic and race, one wonders whether some of the cognitive conditions for magic can also contribute to the aesthetics production of race. If so, then race magic takes the double meaning of race performed in the art of magic and magic at work in the production and performance of race more generally. Um, I mean, we've been talking about like essentialist theories of, of uh, people in the last few days because of the other philosophy of race. And I can see why, uh, like they said before, the mixed race status of uh, Robinson uh, can go to this. Because people get the essentialist version, like there's something essentially different. And so maybe people, other races have uh, different properties and you can do more fancy things than we can do here at home. Like they have magical properties. So... I mean, I could see if with an essentialist viewpoint that that sort of thing might follow, that they are essentially different from us, but that also might give them special powers. Okay. Race magic in both senses abounds with ironies, paradoxes, and contradictions, and what follows just a few of... These are discussed in relation to the persistent idea that Chinese cannot assimilate, yet are easy to aesthetically appropriate. Unassimilable. Bone rituals. They send their gains away to China. They send their bones back after their death. They even spurn our soil as a final resting place for their bodies. A Senator Sargent of California speaking to the 43rd U.S. Congress, February 13th, 1879. The great company of Negro slaves have been replaced by another one just like it of Chinese laborers. I've not actually heard people say that before. I guess sentiment back in the day. All day long, I see... The stupid faces of these men who are so civilized and refined in the art and so brutish in their customs and habits. All right, so Ramon Gil Navarro, Gold Rush Miner, June 17th, 1850. The Yellow Peril and the Chinese Exclusion Act were both driven in part by a fear that still circulates today. The Chinese are too far to ever fully assimilate, whether by custom, ideology, or temperament. In an 1879 speech before Congress, Senator Sargent of California argued that the Chinese were unique among foreigners in their inability to assimilate into any other culture and were especially at odds with Americanization. The Chinese were, as he put it, the same as, the, same as they were when they first came, entirely in every sense of the word indigestible. Excuse me. The supposed shift of Chinese Americans to mod model minority status in the latter half of the 20th century complicated but did not extinguish the idea that the Chinese are in interminably foreign and it is easy to find this still expressed in the media, scholarship, and everyday conversation. The idea is no longer couched in exclusively negative terms. The supposed Chinese resistance to assimilation is sometimes used to exemplify and even valorize the maintenance of cultural integrity many generations past immigration. But the foreignness of Chinese people remains. Consider the familiarity of the question, where are you from, but where are you really from, to Chinese Americans. These tensions between race and... What was it? That's one of these guys. He's like, I'm really from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. There's no other place I'm from. It's like been here 150 years, probably before you guys have been here. <laughs> yeah, some guy was saying that. I'm sorry. Continuing. These tensions between racism, assimilation, and cultural integrity are manifest in recent art installation titled Requiem by Chinese American artist Summer Mei Ling Li. In 2017, to mark the 135th anniversary of the Exclusion Act, the Chinese Cultural Center of San Francisco commissioned Li to create Requiem, which explores the history of the bone boxes that carry the remains of Chinese migrants back to their ancestral villages in China for burial. Two migrants arranging for their bones to be returned home after death honored essential and long-standing cultural practices. To non-Chinese, this was just this was one of the most brutish and vulgar Chinese customs standing in the way of assimilation and in contrast to the refined and admired Chinese arts. 
to those fearing a yellow peril, it was telling that even the bones of the Chinese could not be taken into the soil of America. But for Chinese burial, one's home village maintained sacrosanct cultural rituals and resisted the material assimilation of the body into land that had ruled them, per, uh, had ruled them permanent aliens. However, the bone boxes did not always make it home. The Tonghua Hospital in Hong Kong, a charity that oversaw repatriation of thousands of migrant bodies, Migrant's Bones still shelters many of these unclaimed boxes. Some of them are empty, having been vandalized during shipment. This is how Lee described the moment of weeping upon seeing an empty bone box for the first time. There were a lot of conditions that led to the ineffable moment, like my being a descendant of Chinese immigrants and understanding it tied into the, this Chinese cultural tradition and understanding of ancestral sacrifice for my own ability to even make art. I'm very aware of that, and that's part of the context I was raised in by my Chinese grandmother. I was a descendant in a strange way of that emptiness in the box, and it made me reflect on the fragility of my own existence. Inspired by the untold stories of dislocation, migration, and loss evoked by the empty bone box, Lee created Requiem, uh, figure two, all right, so I guess that's down there, I'll get down to it in a sec, to be a ritual movement through place, and place time, and identity. The installation required viewers to guide themselves with a flashlight through a series of darkened rooms with overlapping scenes from the Chinese diasp diasporic journey. Kaiping, Taihan, Hong Kong, ocean steamers, Chinese junk boats, Angel Island, San Francisco's Chinatown. These large murals were painted on, painted with ash from incense, still burned today by a caretaker for the unclaimed bo bone boxes at Tung Wah. Translucent? White cloth scrolls partially obscured the scenes, and migrating geese projected on the ceilings came and went as the viewer's flashlight moved. At the center of the glass bay was a single worn bone box upon an altar. The name remained, but the body was gone. In response to the question of what she sought to invoke with Requiem, Lee has said, Welcome home to an unhome. Also absence and presence. I really do think that what I was looking at in the box they first presented to me was this emptiness that exploded into a huge presence. Like a magic trick in which, which something appears out of nothing, viewing the empty bone box summons all that was em embodied in one person's migration as a synecdote for the Chinese diaspora. How this is possible can be explained according to a rather unusual conception of the body in early Chinese culture, the tea body. There are a surprising number of distinct conceptions of the body in early China. One thing that distinguishes the tea body is that it is both the most corporeal and the most transmutable. It overlaps and extends into other tea bodies, creating larger bodies or divides while still retaining wholeness. As a result, one person can have several tea bodies or many people can form a common tea body, Tong Ti. Tea also means embody and is associated with ritual, Li, through this meaning, for example, in the Liji or Book of Rites, where the ritual is compared to a great body that can be embodied by individual participants. The two Chinese characters for tea and Li share one symbol, meaning ritual vessel, and tea, the radical for bone, is added where Li contains altar. Interesting. As the body of the senses, the corporeal tea body a, is a transforming site of cultural meaning. It is a subject to the aesthetic force of perception upon imagination, memory, self-understanding, and deep embodiment. As aesthetic rituals, the caretaking at Tung Wah in Hong Kong and Requiem in San Francisco shaped a common tea body of participants that include those migrants who were, by force or choice, in memory and imagination, not assimilated. Appropriation, race, magic. The belief in the unassimilable and perpetually foreign nature of the Chinese has existed in dynamic with the contradictory belief that the aesthetics of Chinese culture can be easily appropriated. Why are these beliefs contradictory? All right, so let me zoom in for a sec, so you might get a, uh... all right, so that looks sort of like a, oh, so it's like a case that looks sort of uh, leather wrapped, and so it's like a leather bound uh, case with a sort of like a reed bottom, so like a woven base with like some sort of leather, uh, top to it so i guess that's so it's an empty box that once held uh some uh someone's bones okay why are these beliefs contradictory why is it not appropriation impl implicated in rather than contradicted by the assumption that people are assimil unassimilated if a culture is impenetrably other, then I am restricted to appropriating it through superficial imitation and fantasy. Indeed, as Ray Chow has remarked, fantasy is a problem which is generally recognized as central to 
Orientalist perceptions and significa significations. Yet, what the, while the supposed foreignness of Chinese culture invites easy aesthetic appropriation, or, in a darker vein, encourages what Frank Chin and Jeffrey Paul Chin named racist love, the psychological compatibility of foreignness with appropriation does not make this relationship non-contradictory. Humans live comfortably with all manner of contradictions when it comes to race. Additionally, it is not some of the pleasure taken in appropriation, the feeling that something authentic has been grasped or at least touched her, even if just aesthetically. The point here does not depend on whether or not that feeling is accurate. Yeah, I think that is what I was saying earlier, that when you, the more you separate something out, like something becomes far and, and becomes more and more taboo, like you can't do it, you can't get to it, then in some sense, it becomes a greater and greater object of desire. It's like the distance makes the heart grow fonder. When something is more and more forbidden to you, that's what you want more and more. And so this sort of essentialist, uh, well, not necessarily essentialist, they didn't say that, I did. But um, this sort of way of separating something out is alien and uh, like separate from like what is known here, then it becomes, of course, something that people want. Yeah. All right. Circling back to an art much less solemn than Lee's Requiem, did Robinson confidently appropriate the sarc aesthetics of a stereotypical Chineseness because he believed there was something authentic about his performance? We cannot know the answer to this question, but magic certainly helped sell the act in at least two different ways to both audiences and Robinson. The first occurred at the sarc aesthetic or surface level where Chineseness is imaginatively associated with and conceptually structured by magic and abstruse knowledge. If the aesthetics of an Orientalist Chineseness invokes, evo easily invokes magic, then a magician pretending to be Chinese is not much of a creative leap, especially when playing upon the imaginative possibilities of mixed race aesthetic ambiguities. The public also contributed to the race magic operating at this level by refusing clear evidence of Robinson's real identity. For example, at one point, Chi Ling Fu attempted to prove Robinson was not Chinese by publicly pointing out that he wore a Chinese woman's gown rather than a man's, but audiences insisted on his authenticity. Even an even more striking moment of public cognitive dissonance, Robinson himself reveals his identity after being beaten up by dock, wors dock workers who mistook him for Chinese coolie laborer. He permitted a newspaper to publish his true identity as a protective measure against further anti-Chinese racism, but his audiences simply treated the report as a hoax. Yeah, this is fake news right there. It is certainly possible that audiences did not have full faith in Robinson's Chineseness and helped help maintain the illusion so popular so the show the popular show could go on. Either way, these moments uh, how's my bit right? I got a little message warning. I hope I'm okay. Either way, these these in these moments audiences upheld a pair of related contradictions. Chinese are impossible to assimilate yet easy uh, sorry, lost the spot. Chinese are impossible to assimilate yet easy to appropriate, and Robin's Chineseness is impossible yet believable, with parallels to the antinomic cognitive conditions of magic that allow us to experience magic as impossible yet happening and real and unreal at the same time. Returning to Leddington's account of the cognitive conditions of magic, he offers a novel suggestion that may help uh, clarify the public response to Robinson's appropriation of Chineseness. According to Leddington, the dual nature of magic does not arise because of a suspension of disbelief or mere conflict of beliefs, as is often claimed. Instead, magic involves belief discordant alief, a term he borrows from Tamo, Tamar Sazbo Gendler, meaning an evidence insensitive as if representation. An alief is representational content in our cognitive system that is activated by features of our internal or ambivalent environment, inclining us to feel and act in a certain way, but not endorsed like a belief. But quoting Gendler here, if I believe that P and a leaf that not P, something is amiss. So we're getting a straight up uh, more like paradox actually here, more statement. Learning that not P may well not cause me to cease of a leaving that P, but if it does not, then I am violating certain norms of cognitive behavioral coherence. So I guess this is so it's a like a sub belief. You're not quite at the level of believing, but it has like the appearance of a belief. And at this level, you can have a sort of contradictory, um, not necessarily contradictory beliefs, but you can have like sort of incompatible a leafs. So you don't actually have to endorse them even at the level of like a belief, but something even uh, less um, strong. Okay. 
No such criticism is possible in the analogous case of imagining. When we, dis we, when we suspend disbelief by imagining, for example, when reading fiction, we do not violate any cognitive norms. I cannot imagine not P while believing P. No. But magic requires that the audience does not believe what they are seeing is possible. This explanation of magic works as a potential account of the cognitive dissonance Robinson's audience maintained. They A-leaved rather than B-leaved in Robinson's Chinese-ness. In this case, the public denial of Robinson's true identity was not a suspension of disbelief, which is limited to possibilities we do not experience as real, such as fiction or conscious fantasy. Instead, audiences experience Robinson's yellow-faced persona as real. The experience of magic would have already primed them toward violating the cognitive norms that prevent us from experiencing the impossible as really happening, and there were certainly features of their internal, uh, internal racialized and racist attitudes and ambivalent racialized and racist entertainment, yellow peril rhetoric, and the Chinese Exclusion Act environments that would incline them toward the evidence insensitive a leave that Ching Ling Su was authentically Chinese. No, no. Ching Ling Su was uh, Chinese. It was Chung Ling Su that wasn't. Um, oh no, it was. Okay. I thought it was Chung Ling Su. Oh, and uh, we had Ching Ling Fu and Chung Ling Su. So maybe this is. Maybe, am I wrong or is this a typo? Maybe just. I um, got my got my names mixed up. I thought it was Chung though. I guess let me check real fast. I kind of want to get this right. I'm gonna lose my spot. Oh dear. Yeah, Chung Ling Su and Ching Ling Fu. Okay, so it's definitely not the yeah. The, it's the middle names that are the same, but not the first. All right, so maybe a typo there. Okay. Even if not all of Robinson's fans were caught in the cognitive incoherence of a leaving as real what they do not believe, the public remained invested in the performance for other reasons that speak to the dynamics of, between race and magic. For one, an orientalist inversion of Chinese authenticity paradoxically encourages their penchant for knockoff Chinese magicians. This can be contrasted with certain historical notions of black expressive authenticity. Whereas black identities have often been bound up with what Paul Taylor describes as assumptions about rootedness, assumptions in other words, about being empirically attached and eth ethnic ethically committed to some formative experience and to the hallowed site of their occurrence, authentic Chineseness in the golden age of magic became paradoxically bound in detachment from and erasure of roots. This, in turn, strengthened the belief that the Chinese are easily to aesthetically appropriate while impossible to assimilate. Goto Jones' analysis about Orientalism and capitalism shaped racial authenticity during this time is useful here. As he describes it, Fu was radically disempowered in his claims to own, own, own to his own Chinese ancestry by the twin forces of commercial imperatives and pervasive Orientalism in society. As a consequence, Fu came to represent irrelevant real China or mundane Orient compared to the desired magical Orient created in the theaters stage magic by white West men expressed in Su's orientalist persona. Thus, like magic, Fu could be from China without being Chinese, and Su could be Chinese without coming from China, orientalism, not Su's pantomimical charade, and not even the training required to carry a bowl of water between his knees, was the secret to the great illusion. The aesthetics of yellow face magic rang true because of an orient Orientalist inversion of authenticity in which the fake became real. This is a seems like very much our modern politics. While well, Goto Jones' analysis insightfully details the Orientalist aesthetics of authenticity, it minimizes the importance of physical skill in acting as other ways that magic operated in Robinson's race act beyond its association with the Orient. The relationship between magic and acting and the embodied skill required for both are noted in a well-circulated quote from Jean-Eugene Robert Houdin in Secrets of Conjuring and Magic. A conjurer is not a juggler, he is an actor playing the, the part of a magician. He explains that a conjurer seeking to convince spectators of real magic should use quieter, less exaggerated movements. The magician is an artist whose fingers have more need to move with deafness than with speed. Here, he critiques the mismatch between the word prestidigitation, nimble fingers, sleight of hand, and the art it describes. 
The word prestidigitation therefore only imperfectly describes the art which it denotes. Instead of creating new names, would it not have been better for the adepts of ma white magic to have retained the term at once appropriate and exhaustive, which we find in Pl Plautus and in many dictionaries, both ancient and modern? Prejudicator, Latin prejudicator, worker of wonders, prestigious. Following, following this description, an actor is a conjurer of sorts, even when not a magician, and surely a worker of wonders. Producing a giant bowl of water from under one's gown is impressive, but no more and perhaps less than bringing to life an uncanny, convincing, and embodied character. So it's seeming more and more like uh, pro wrestling at this point, where people are sort of embodying things that they clearly are not, but we still kind of love our pro wrestling here. So that's kind of how I feel about maybe a, a similar parallel. Now Robinson's performance as Chinese was not good acting in it, in any deft or subtle sense of the craft, and like other ri racialized performances of his day, was popular in virtue of being a caricature. But Robinson's skill as a magician likely helped occlude his shoddy acting performance for the cognitive and cultural reasons already discussed, and because his magic skills were embodied in a first-person manner. While Robinson's performance of Chineseness was sarcastic and poorly acted, his performance of magic was so aesthetic and skilled. Given the deep association of Chineseness with magic, could an adept physical performance of magic have pushed an otherwise boorish race performance toward authenticity? Outside the theatrical arts, the construction, naturalization, and the maintenance of race demonstrates the reality of the tea body as both externally discursive and internally embodied. Transferring this to Robinson's performance, it was not convincing not convincing acting that made the magician Chinese. It was embodied magic that made the appropriation believable. Okay, so the argument here is that in becoming in the sort of the fake being Chinese, at the time with the uh, sort of the already sort of fake understanding that we have of magic, so in, so, in, in some sense wrapping the whole persona up with the magic that was a, a the magical performance, it sort of all sort of mutually supported itself because it was also what people wanted in sort of the uh, characterization of the Chinese. And so people were willing to overlook obvious like, contradictions that he published his real name and was not Chinese at all. Okay, so. Shen Zai and the Legacy of Yellow Peril. Returning is the movement of Tao. The new merges from surprising variations and combinations. The Shanghai illustrates a particular type of creativity. Gradually, its products depart from the original and until they mutate into the originals themselves. In what proceeds, I have endeavored to show that the dynamic between magic and race is a unique lens through which to view creativity, art, and aesthetics at work in performative ontologies of race and to indicate one of many ways that the ordinariness of race embolizes its phantasmagoric nature. As with the contradictory cognitive conditions required for magic and for unassimilable appropriation, race is maintained in part by our capacity to perceive and experience something as real and unreal or possible and impossible at the same time. Race in an essential sense is impossible. Even the most devoted essentialists about race such as anti Messianogenists testify to this in their anxieties about the fragility and instability of race. Yet recognizing the construction of race is not magical, and not a magical moment in which the, its realities disappear. In fact, the ways that race continues to happen right before our eyes, our very eyes, attest to the corporeal reality of the aesthetic production of race via the tea body. While fears of mis missing don't know this word, Mis misingenuation may be waning in favor of mixed race people as opposed to post-racial utopian fantasies, this further encourages the experience of race as both real and unreal. In the body of mixed race people, the mutability of race attests to its unreality, while at the same time new racial chimeras are realized and old forms are further reified. Consider the familiarity of the ironic statements like, you're so unique looking, you have Chinese nose, white eyes, and black hair to mixed race people. The ongoing return to the old by the new, whether through inspiration or plundering, is a fundamental way, a Tao, of creating. This this mode of creativity presents itself in a new twist into the story of the yellow faced magician told here. China is now home to the world's reigning knockoff artists. China and to an extent yes, yeah, true, I hadn't thought about that. China and to an extent contemporary Chinese culture is now associated with forgery and fakery, or Chinese or in Chinese called Shangzai. 
Fake luxury goods like cell phones and handbags are well known outside China, but it, but as the literal meaning of Shanghai is as a bandit mountain stronghold indicates, it in, includes much more. There are Shanghai books and movies, Shanghai Nobel Prize, Shanghai pop stars, and even politicians. Byung Chul Han describes Shanghai as genuinely Chinese phenomenon because these counterfeits adapt to particular needs and situations more quickly and ingen ingeniously than the originals. Their adaptive agility, as well as innovative technological and aesthetic modifications, give Shanghai products and personas their own identity and distinguish them from crude for forgeries. The culture that supposedly cannot be assimilated has mastered the repurposing of cultural artifacts, both foreign and domestic. In at least this sense, the yellow power legacy of unassi unassimilable appropriation continues, but with the Chinese as appropriators. Could we retrospectively describe Cheng Ling Su as, Shanghai, as a Shanghai Chinese magician? Racially, his performance was a crude forgery, yet he was also a skilled magician who innovated upon difficult tricks in Chinese magic. He certainly adapted to circumstances going so far as to become at least aesthetically Chinese. And Robinson was able to pull this off because of an inversion of authenticity in which the fake became seen as the real. However, Shanghai are not usually meant to be deceptive. Their appeal, as Han puts it, lies in how they specifically draw attention to the fact that they are not original, that they are playing with the original. Yeah, uh, my cousin mentioned this to me. He says he was looking at some of these products. He called them homages. Like, so uh, everything was, it, what, they weren't trying to actually play, be the original. They were trying to make an homage to the original. And they were like high quality things. And he was looking at them. He thought it was kind of interesting. Shenzai are honest expressions of creative and capitalist power of copying or mimesis and demonstrate that any sufficiently creative process produces something original. Robinson, in contrast, relied on the yellow peril, racism, and only reluctantly acknowledged his fakery for reasons of self-preservation, not creative ingenuity. While there are no norms preventing the production of racist Shenzai, unlike a fake iPhone or handbag or even a fake movie star, race has been produced by brutality, violence, and oppression. This means racial imitation is almost always morally fraught, even in instances where it may overlap with Shang Zai. Shang Zai also differs from Robinson's performance because they are not produced by the cultural and cognitive contradictions that preclude Robinson's authenticity, public perception notwithstanding. Shang Zai becomes or original without lying about their origins or as a result of an inversion of fake and real that depends on the er erasure of roots. The impossibility of Robinson ever becoming an original Chinese magician was insurmountable at the outset because of race, for obvious reasons, as well as the conditions upholding the dynamic between race and magic. The, race erasure of the, or the racist erasure of the origins of his act was necessary to the performance, in contrast to the best Shang Zai, which rely on an open engagement with their original as a way to bring forth something genuinely new, much like a great cover song. The aptly titled Shang Zai, released in 2014 by Fatima al Qadiri, brilliantly illustrates this. The song features Hanlin Fang singing Nothing Compares to You, written by Prince and made famous by Sinead O'Connor. The old form of this song about incomparability exists as a new aesthetic creation standing as a compelling work of art in its own right. A single listing set sets this version as an original by which any f future cover will be judged and as something never heard before. The title is not just apt and ironic, it is perfectly eponymous for a Shanzai work created in an ongoing time of yellow peril. Okay, so this has touched on a bunch of things, really. We had, like, the political, we had the uh, race theories, we had the aesthetics. So a lot happened in this paper, so that's kind of interesting. Just It hit a bunch of points. Um, we got the history here, and then it's, like, basically, in, it's sort of making a... With all the quotes from politicians that were quoted here too, it was really um, sort of, I mean, it, it's definitely trying to pull some sort of a parallel to current politics, I would say too, but just the state of politics in the United States where you have current ongoing politicians saying pretty, uh, let's just go with, they're saying things in, I guess, the grand tradition of this country. So, yeah, so how do we understand the aesthetics that's going on here? I think I, I liked my example of the uh, 
pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is very hard and it's not entirely fake. Like people have to work extremely hard to do the things they do and they don't always know the outcomes of their matches. But in some sense they have to like sort of take on the persona. And in this case, I mean it was a Chinese um uh race that had to be taken on. But I mean at least in uh, they're not doing that sort of thing in uh in pro wrestling ways they're not doing it uh, uh, lately but they still sort of have to take on this whole thing and but even though you know that they can't possibly be this way all the time it's like this can't be how they really are because that would just be insane if like the pro wrestlers were acting that way all the time i mean you couldn't live with them but uh so it's like this sort of fake but you know it's fake but in some sense there's a we're willing to take on in something we know in the A-leaf way, which is like somehow lesser than belief, but in some sense is still getting us, it gets us enough of the way there that we're willing to watch the show. Um, and so I guess that's kind of what's going on with this. Um, and, and this is a nice way of showing that um, this sort of aesthetic appreciation has sort of far-reaching... Um, consequences in terms of how we view people in the media uh how art and aesthetics uh as they showed with the um the uh, bone box uh in requiem here and so how we understand the art and how we can understand that like there's something missing about the culture on the history but in its missing in some sense and in that it lacks is how we understand the culture and so it's missing something essential as they were saying before but in some sense, by not being there, it pulls in all of our preconceptions about the uh, cultural significance. And that's what was getting played up in the Magic Act by specifically playing up on the Chinese-ness. They were playing up on the uh, culture of the day, which sort of made it fancy and taboo and alien. Okay, Does, if anyone out there has any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I think I've said everything I can think of right now. Uh, I will be back, I think, what is today? Say Sunday? I usually take Mondays off, so I'll be back Tuesday with another paper. Alright, everyone, please stay safe out there and have a great night. And of course, if you have anything you want me to read, please let me know too. Always like suggestions. Otherwise, actually, oh, uh, well, if it's in the race, uh, philosophy of race. I'm doing only philosophy of race for a while. But that's cool too. If it's something else, I'll put it on the docket for later. Bye-bye.